Recently, Marvel revealed the very first teaser for their brand new event that's coming at the end of the year, The King in Black. A teaser that they almost immediately took down when they realized that the choice in words mixed with the rather unique choice in font, um, yeah. Can we go ahead and take that down as well? before YouTube's robots decide to demonetize this entire video. Cool, thanks. But then they replaced that teaser with a far better teaser that got people excited all over again. And for good reason. The King in Black is going to be what Donny Cage's Venom run has been leading up to, and that Venom series has been a smash hit. It has been selling incredibly well and has been critically acclaimed, something I haven't been able to say about Venom series in almost a decade. But, for the larger landscape of comics in general, this Venom series has been very important, not because it's been leading up to this event, but because it's kind of been what's introduced mainstream audiences to Donny Cates. And since he started on this Venom book, he's gone on to be one of the most talked about writers over at Marvel. However, if you're a fan of Image Comics, then you were probably aware of Donny Cates long before he started working over at Marvel, thanks to his series God Country, a story that really highlighted his ability to delve into serious family issues while merging it with far out sci-fi concepts. From there, he continued to expand upon his love of southern landscapes and fantasy with Rednecks, a story about a family of vampires living in Texas. These two books were the series that got people talking about Donny Cates and in many ways helped propel him to his position over at Marvel. However, like with many writers out there, Donny Cates didn't just put out there an indie smash hit and then all of a sudden everyone loved him. No, The Road to God Country was paved with a string of smaller series that nobody really talks about. But you know who does talk about them? Me. Yeah, I'm not saying this right now to come in here and feel superior or to show off my big brain comic book knowledge or to prove my hipster cred because trust me, between these glasses and the fact that I look like the entire band of Weezer all rolled into one person, Kai has that covered, but... I was a huge fan of Donny Cates long before he struck it big. I remember back when I was working at the comic book shop, I was rooting him on and I was going up to all my fellow co-workers and saying, look out for this guy. This guy is going to be huge one day. But no matter how hard I tried to sell his books, none of my fellow co-workers ever decided to check any of them out. That is until God Country came out and then all of a sudden everybody couldn't stop talking about him and uh, you know. That felt kind of nice. Vindication! So today I wanted to do a career spotlight and focus on the earlier works of Donny Cates, because despite how big he's become within the industry, it still feels like most people don't really know about his earlier books, the ones that really helped to pave the way for his later success. And when I say pave the way for his later success, I'm talking about in terms of his growth within the industry. I'm not talking about in terms of quality. There are a lot of amazing writers out there that you go back to their earlier stuff and you go, yeah, ooh, I don't know, but you can kind of see how they were going to become good later on. No. I think every single one of the books I'm going to talk about today are great. I love them. In fact, if I'm being totally honest with you guys, and I typically am, one of the books I'm going to talk about today might very well be in my top 10 favorite books of all time. So hopefully you guys find something among these books that you've never heard of that will really intrigue you guys as well. Enjoy. Let's start with the book that really kicked it all off for Mr. Cates, Buzzkill, which he did for Dark Horse Comics back in 2013 and was his first big collaboration with his longtime partner Jeff Shaw. This series is about a superhero who gets his powers whenever he does drugs. Okay, now let me just go ahead and admit something. When I heard this premise, I rolled my eyes so hard at it. Yes, I will fully admit that this concept sounded like so many other books out there that were trying so hard to be edgy. And not just edgy, but a style of edgy that died out in the 90s and thankfully has remained there. However, I saw the book was receiving very positive reviews, so I decided to check it out and what I found was a book that took this concept and went deep with it. You see, if you're anything like me, when you hear this concept, you picture either a story about someone drinking and smoking and partying and going out and punching villains really hard, a yeah, look at how cool I am, kids, kind of title. Or you picture the exact opposite, which is a book about a character being grim and dark and trying to be super serious because that's how the world is. But in actuality, it's just a paper thin excuse to be angsty. But what I ended up getting was anything but that. This is the story of someone who, yes, they do get superpowers by doing drugs, whether it be drinking alcohol, smoking cigarettes, or 
you know, doing something a little bit stronger that I can't really talk about because, again, the whole demonetization thing. But whenever they do a drug, they end up gaining a different superpower. However, this is a story about what happens to them when they have hit rock bottom. It's the story of someone who is going to Drug Addicts Anonymous meetings because they've done such terrible things while under the influence that they have to stop themselves and they need help. However, as I said, they get superpowers when they do these drugs and the villains keep coming. It's not like he can tell the bad guys, oh no, sorry guys, I don't do that anymore. I'm, I'm trying to give it up so maybe you could respect that and just, I don't know, cut out all the evil. No, super villains keep coming and because of that, he feels that pull. He feels that need to, for lack of a better term, suit up again. Once you really get into this book, you understand how brilliant the metaphor is that's being crafted here. Our protagonist gets superpowers when they're high. And for anyone out there who has ever known a drug addict, you see exactly what he is trying to say in this book. That's exactly how a lot of drug addicts feel when they, well, suit up. Sorry, I'm trying really hard to be careful with my wording on this one. But yes, this is clearly meant to be a metaphor for how people on drugs feel, but it goes further than that. You've all read some superhero story here or there where the hero quits, where they say they can't do it anymore. I mean, hell, Spider-Man has quit like nine times. He does it one more time and he gets a free sandwich. But they always have to put that suit on again. They always have to get back into the fight because there's always that call to action. There's always someone who needs saving. There's always a villain to fight. So they get pulled back in. Again, that's how a lot of drug addicts feel when they give up. It feels like that addiction is pulling them back in. So Cates took that story of a superhero quitting that we're all familiar with and used it to paint a picture of addiction, of how addiction refuses to let go of someone once it gets its claws into them. And I don't want to reveal too much about this book, it is excellent and deserves to be read, but I do have to touch on one last part of the series that makes this a brilliant story about addiction. You see, our protagonist had to get his powers from somewhere. So, where did they come from? Symbol, his father. These powers are genetic and got passed down to him, which is another part of how this whole superpower drug addiction metaphor pays off. Many addicts get their addiction from their parents, either from seeing their parents' behavior and trying to imitate it, or in some cases, such as with alcoholism, quite literally being a genetic condition that is passed down to them. So by having the big bad the whole series be the father of our hero, it serves as another layer to this story that makes it such a deep look at addiction. One that on paper, I will admit I wasn't buying, but by the end, I was eating my words on this. And when examining his future series, you can look at this book as the start of Cage's long-running theme of writing stories about troubled father-son relationships and how he used the fantastical to make these stories feel even more human. Now for his next series, Cates followed this up in 2014 with Ghost Fleet, which he did alongside Future Extremity and Murder Falcon superstar Daniel Warren Johnson, which is really, really weird. Not bad, no, 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 not at all. It's still good, I wouldn't be talking about it on this show if it wasn't, but it's one of those books where you can look at the scope of it and at what they wanted to do with it. And you think to yourself, oh my gosh, this sounds amazing. This sounds epic. This sounds like it could be one of the craziest and most unique long running series of our lives. But then this book got canceled by issue eight and they had to take this entire story that they were playing on telling over the span of who knows how many years and then cram it all into a handful of issues. And by the time that you get to issue four, you can really tell that they're now trying their hardest to take this entire story that they wanted to tell and start shoving it into the final few issues. But as I said, the book is still good. However, because it was cut short, it didn't have time to A, flesh out a lot of the ideas that were being put forth in the series and they ended up just kind of going nuts in the final two issues, and B, I will admit, it does not have the emotional depth that a lot of other Dying Kate's books have. 
However, Donny Cage isn't known just for his ability to take big crazy concepts and characters and give them emotional growth and hearts underneath it all. No, he's also known for going balls to the wall crazy when he wants to. Sometimes it feels like Donny Cage's zodiac sign is a knob that's being cranked up to 11, and I say that as a good thing. It's one of the things that I love about his writing. And this book, because it was essentially just the Cliff Notes version of the larger story they wanted to tell, almost feels like Donny Cates' id. Just the biggest, craziest stuff he wants to see being thrown up onto the page with amazing artwork from Johnson to bring it to life. And I will admit, it doesn't always work. There is one scene in particular that I thought went too far, and in the book's defense, in the final issue, they actually do have a narrator come on and say, yeah, maybe we shouldn't have done that one thing. But aside from that, this book still feels like that level of imagination and dark humor that I love about Kate. And it's loaded with memorable characters that I absolutely want to see return in something else. For example, there's a character in here who is meant to be the world's greatest assassin, and his personality is so blown out of proportion it can't even be contained within one character. No, seriously, he has a black t-shirt with white text on, but the white text is constantly changing to basically be just whatever his internal monologue is. It's never explained, it has nothing to do with the story, we don't even know if it's actually something the other characters can see or if it's just a joke here for the audience, but in this crazy world that they've created, it works. But what is Ghost Fleet about? Well, essentially, the United States government has secret highways and roads that they use for transporting valuable cargo. And issue number one, I will admit, I wasn't really feeling it because while the action was over the top in the best way possible, the pitch behind the story just felt a little too basic to me. Okay, secret roads. Interesting, but aside from that, it felt like some standard government operative betrayed by his team sort of thing, and I just had no interest in it. In fact, I read this book on my lunch break at the comic shop and I didn't have time to finish the first issue. I got all the way up to the last two pages, but I wasn't really feeling it, so I decided not to return to it. Little did I know, if I had just read those last two pages, I would have been pulled back in because the tease for where this story is going on the final page of issue number one, the glimpse it gives you at what the end game of this story is instantly hooked me when I came back to this book so many years later. And again, not going to spoil anything, but when you see what the story is actually about, what these agents are transporting, how far out there the ideas go, yet yeah, kind of feels tragic that we never got to see what became of the book. I know that God Country was bought up to be turned into a film, although actually I have no idea if that's even still happening. There's all kinds of weird rumors going around about that, but I'm not going to get into that. However, if there is one Donny Cage property I want adapted into another medium, it's Ghost Fleet. I want this to be turned into a TV series so we can see this big story that they had planned actually fleshed out. I want to see where all the dangling plot threads would have gone. I want to see the deeper story behind these characters that you can feel is sitting right there. I am telling you, HBO, Netflix, somebody buy this thing up. Also, I can say this for Ghost Fleet. Again, I don't want to give away too much about where the story goes, but years later, after God Country was a huge hit, but just before he got hired for Marvel, Donny Cage did get hired for Aftershock Comics for a story called Baby Teeth, another great series that we've talked about a few times on this channel, and after going back and rereading Ghost Fleet, it almost feels like that book was a spiritual successor to Ghost Fleet. Not in terms of tone, no, they are polar opposites on that, but it does feel like many of the ideas for storylines that might have one day been in Ghost Fleet got to live on in one way or another over in that series. But I'm mostly just bringing this up again so that I can plug Baby Teeth, because even though it doesn't really count for his earlier works, i.e. the books that we're looking at today, it is totally worth checking out as well, and I don't think enough people know about that series. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, alright, Ghost Fleet and Buzzkill, they were from Dark Horse. That's not really all that obscure. They're in the top five publishers out there. What did he do that's really out there? Glad you asked. This next series comes from Heavy Metal Comics. Yeah, remember a few years ago when Grant Morrison took over Heavy Metal and he tried to launch a bunch of new series under that label? 
Sadly, it didn't work out, but it did actually result in some great hidden gems that deserve more attention. Chief among them being Interceptor. This is a series about a future where mankind had to escape into space because Earth became overrun by vampires. But the future president, who happens to have the body of a child for reasons I won't go into right now, creates a super soldier specifically designed to take down these bloodsuckers and sends her and a supercharged holy mech down to what remains of the plant to clean up. However, when she gets there, our protagonist finds that Earth isn't quite what she had been told to expect and that there are still humans left roaming around trying to fight back against the vampires. And now she has to save them, while at the same time questioning why the Earth government and the president were lying to her. In many ways, this series reminds me of Ghost Fleet, and that's low with fast-paced crazy action, and both of them have a real grindhouse vibe to them. Ghost Fleet feels like some 70s action crime thriller, at least up until everything goes nuts, and Interceptor feels like some cult classic 70s sci-fi film. Both of them feel like those films that if you went into an old video rental store back in the 90s, there'd be some guy behind the counter who would look at you and go, Oh, you want the really good stuff? Oh, oh, this is the stuff that you should check out. But the big difference between Interceptor and Ghost Fleet, outside of, you know, space and vampires, is that this series has far better pacing, because it feels like Cage went into this realizing, okay, I've only got a limited number of issues to tell this entire story, so I'm gonna get in, get out, and leave an opening for more in case I get the chance. And he was able to pull this off very well. The series moves quickly, but it never feels rushed, in the midst of all this vampire fighting, he still managed to put in there a great relationship between our hero and a small child that she meets on Earth, who is a foul-mouthed ball of destruction, really serving as a great foil to our hero's stone-faced professionalism. And the series actually did end up getting a sequel, Reactor. Except that book ended up moving over to Vault Comics, which is good news. Vault is a pretty great place for really crazy original sci-fi comics. But the bad news is, it never ended. It was meant to go on for four issues, and issue number three came out in 2018, ends with a big fat to be concluded. And yeah, looks like that's not going to happen. However, Interceptor is still a great series that feels very self-contained, wraps up in a way that feels like you don't need anything else, and is a great mix of humor, action, and far out there concepts. Basically, it's all the stuff that I enjoy about Donny Cates' writing. However, that brings us to the final book that I wanted to talk about today, and as I said, there was one book from Cates that went on to be probably in my top 10 favorite comics of all time. Definitely my top 10 favorite superhero comics. And if you've been with us for a long time, then you already know what I'm going to say because I have talked about this many times before. Paybacks. The concept behind this series is simple, but it's also brilliant in that it's an idea that someone really should have had a long time ago, and yet I've never seen it before. So you know how superheroes have secret layers and tons of gadgets and high-tech costumes? Yeah, do you know how much that must cost? More than a mild-mannered reporter makes in a year, I'll tell you that. When you actually break it all down, even the richest of heroes would be bleeding cash after their third super suit. So if you want to keep using all these amazing toys and living your best superhero lifestyle, you're going to have to take out a loan. And if you can't make your payments on time, then you have to answer to the Paybacks, a group of superhero repo men. And who makes up this band of super repo men? Well, all the superheroes who got so far behind in their debts that now they have to work them off. That is, if they can survive, because, well, let's say you have to go to a pissed off Superman and tell him that he can't use his Fortress of Solitude anymore. You think he's going to take that line down? You think you're just going to be able to walk out of there like it's no big deal? Yeah, just a few issues in and it becomes clear, this book is like if the creator of the Venture Brothers had to write the Suicide Squad. Paybacks ended up combining everything that I really enjoy about Cates' writing. A really unique idea. Amazing humor. Big bombastic moments that are gorgeously portrayed by his old partner Jeff Shaw, and yet in the center of all this wacky zany action, he can still make you care about these characters. Listen, most of the characters in this book start off as nothing but jokes, and they indeed remain as such throughout the series, 
but he will make sure to fit in there some relationships among these characters that make you care about them. Or he'll make sure to give them a big spotlight moment right at a pinnacle scene that will make you stand up and cheer, and those moments are always led up to beautifully. The pacing in this book is so good for like 90% of it. Yeah, we'll get back to that in just a moment. But first, I have to point this out. If you're a big superhero fan, which I know many of my viewers are, you need to read this book. You have to, because this is like walking into the comic book candy store. There are so many references throughout the book, and some of them are just Easter eggs, yes. They're just, oh, hey, look at that thing in the background, which is fun. But there are also references that have weight to them. There is one moment, probably my favorite moment in the entire book, that will make zero sense to you unless you are familiar with the legal battles surrounding a British superhero from the 50s to the 80s. But if you are familiar with what they're referencing, this moment will be a huge deal to you. I literally shout out, ooh, when it happened because it was handled so well. But even beyond characters or specific references, just the references to genres or generations of comics filled me with delight. There is one character on this team who is just the walking embodiment of 90s comics. His superpower is that he has a suit made out of pouches that allow him to create giant guns. If you don't know the 90s, that sounds stupid to you. And if you do know the 90s, that still sounds stupid to you, but you get the joke and you appreciate it. However, if you want to check out Paybacks, well, it's a bit of an odd situation because Paybacks, just like his first two series, started out over at Dark Horse, but sadly it got canceled halfway through its run. But unlike Ghost Fleet, Cates didn't try to rush anything to wrap it all up. Instead, he hoped someone else out there would pick it up, and lo and behold, Heavy Metal Comics came riding in to save the day. At least for a couple of issues. Unfortunately, just like with Interceptor, all those new books that Heavy Metal launched or bought up had to be prematurely canceled as well. So once again, Donnie Cates was forced to wrap things up rather quickly. Yeah, there appears to be a theme among Donny Cates' earlier works. Great ideas, wonderful writing, truly astonishing artwork, and publishers who unfortunately could not let the books end on its natural course. And yes, there are indeed a handful of things in the final issue that feel like they are just quickly slapped in there to tie up loose ends, but you know what? 90% of that final issue still works. And even if it didn't, even if that final issue flopped, I would still be recommending this series because the ride that you go on, the characters that you meet, the big salute to comics that this entire series serves as, and the stellar top-notch timing on some of these jokes absolutely makes this a book worth reading. Just, uh, if you want to give it a shot, it's going to be kind of difficult because the first four issues of this series, the ones put out by Dark Horse, are being sold digitally through Comixology, so you can read the first half of this series through them. But if you get up to issue four and decide, hey, I really like this, I want to continue reading it, the remaining single issues are not available for sale pretty much anywhere unless you can track down an actual physical copy of it. But Dark Horse was able to get the rights to the remaining issues over from Heavy Metal, but only in trade form. So instead of putting out a Volume 1 and Volume 2, they put out a Volume 1, which contains all the books that they own, in other words, those first four issues, but they didn't put out a Volume 2 containing all the Heavy Metal issues. Instead, they put out a complete collection, which has the entire series in it. So your options are basically check this out issue by issue, and then if you like the first four issues and you want to keep reading, you're going to be forced to buy a trade that already contains what you've already read, or you can just take a risk on it and just go ahead and buy the entire thing all at once. Yeah, sometimes the world of hunting down and collecting and reading comics can be a bit of a mess. However, just to throw in one last tidbit about this recommendation, the giant no event that was announced isn't the only book that Dying Cage recently announced. He and Jeff Shaw will be reuniting to do a series for Image called Crossover, 
which he is describing as an anti-crossover book because it's going to be a series about a crossover in comics that is so big it crosses over into the real world. But he says it will star an eccentric cast of characters having to learn the secret of this event. Now, if I had to describe the cast of characters in Paybacks, I would absolutely call them eccentric. Now, the reason why I bring this up is because remember that first book that I brought up, Buzzkill? Yeah, one thing that I didn't mention is that Buzzkill and Paybacks not only were both written and drawn by the same team, but they take place in the same universe. Donny Cates and Jeff Shaw came together and built their own superhero comic book universe between these two series, and now Donny Cates and Jeff Shaw are writing their own superhero crossover event. Now again, they haven't said anything about this. And this is absolutely just me taking a wild guess and crossing my fingers and hoping because oh boy would I like to see this happen. But I have a feeling like there might be a chance we could see some of the characters from this series show back up. Again, the odds of this are, well, who knows? Nothing has been said about. And in all the interviews that I've seen with Donny Cates, no one has brought up Buzzkill and Paybacks because apparently I'm the only person who remembers those books. It's just something I would love to see happen. But if you want to get prepared for the next big book from these two, maybe go and give Buzzkill and Paybacks a shot. Because even if I'm wrong and no one from these books is ever seen again, they're still two amazing books that are worth reading. But that's it. Thanks for tuning in today for our look at the early works of Donny Cates. Go and check them out so that you too can impress the people at your local comic book store with your obscure indie book knowledge or just because they're good books. Listen, as long as it gets more people reading these titles, use whatever motivation you need. And after you do read them, let me know what you thought about them in the comments down below. You can also always follow me around the web on Twitter and Twitch at Professor Thorgy. Stay safe, everybody, and come back next time.